Well, good evening and welcome to our midweek Bible study as we continue through the book of Psalms. Go ahead and turn to Psalm 82. While you're turning there, just want to remind you every uh, Wednesday night at six o'clock, we do this uh, midweek Bible study, and it's so that you and I can experience God's Word together and grow as followers of Jesus. And, um, and, and I hope it's a blessing to you. Uh, we've just gotten off one of the greatest weekends of, of our recent history as a church. It's been a spectacular thing, just living in the afterglow of uh, Resurrection Weekend at First Norway. It was an amazing time, uh, and uh, I am still thrilled uh, by all that God accomplished and is accomplishing even now. Uh, we did Good Friday service Saturday night, two Sunday morning and one Sunday evening uh, worship gatherings, and it, it was just spectacular to see the rooms packed uh, and people gathered uh, to worship King Jesus and the gospel being proclaimed. So uh, I hope that you're still experiencing the joy of that uh, gathering, uh, and together uh, we might live for God's glory in the days that are before us and see what He has in store for our church family uh, in the days ahead. Well, Psalm 82, and I think I said Psalm 82. Psalm 82 talks about God the judge. Now, uh, we need uh, a, a system in which a righteous judge makes righteous decisions, uh, and, uh, and, and when that is absent, there's great turmoil and conflict. Uh, when the, the people that are uh, called to make righteous decisions uh, don't. Uh, when there's corruption in the justices or the judgments of people, we know that it creates chaos in a community. And that's what is addressed in Psalm 82, that uh, God is calling out unjust justices. Now, let me be very clear as to what we're looking at in Psalm 82. We're looking at people that God had appointed in the, uh, in, in the uh, nation of Israel and Judah. God had appointed these judges to make righteous judgments that advance God's kingdom, that flow from the ethics of God's word. And when that was absent, everything began to be unhinged uh, in the, uh, uh, among the people of God, even, but especially, even among uh, those who were uh, the poor and the oppressed. Uh, so as we read Psalm 82, we're listening to God say, uh, I'm about to judge, and I'm going to judge righteously. And, uh, and, and he calls out these unjust justices. All right, so let's look at the eight verses of Psalm 82, read them together, and then let's break them down and see why it's important that God has um, uh, righteous judgment among his people and among the people. All right, so God stands in the congregation of the mighty. And he judges among the gods. Now, we'll come back to that in a second. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Selah. All right, so immediately we understand what's happening. You've got judges who are judging unjustly and showing partiality to the wicked. Bad stuff. Verse 3. Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and the needy. Deliver the poor and the needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. Verse 5 is a different kind of scenario. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are unstable. There's the chaos that happens. Verse 6, I said, quote, you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Verse 8, arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all nations. Now, the primary theme of this passage is God is the judge, and he desires just judgment because 
He loves and values all human life. Now, that is key for us to understand. Made in the image of God, in the likeness of God, Genesis 1, 27 and 28, God created all humanity in His image and His likeness. And because humanity, human beings, regardless their ethnicity, their background, their socioeconomic uh, 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 good or bad, regardless of their heritage, their religious uh, affiliation, God has stamped upon every human being His image and likeness. And therefore, He values and He loves all humanity. Because He values all humanity, He demands righteous judgment uh, among the nations. All right, so here's what we need to unwrap. In verses 1, uh, it talks about the uh, congregation or the assembly of the mighty, and it, it speaks about uh, judges among the gods. So God is judging among the gods. Verse 6 and 7, he says, uh, this, uh, uh, Scripture says, I said, and this is God speaking, you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. All right, so let's unravel little g-o-d-s that we see in verse 1 and that we see in verses 6 and 7. What is that a reference to? Uh, well, some translations uh, are judges. So uh, it's the assembly of the mighty ones. This is, that would mean that that's the assembly of God's people, Israel, and God is judging among the judges. He is uh, calling out judges. Now, in the Hebrew language, God's little G-O-D-S, G-O-D-S is Elohim. And in this context, some interpreters have determined that that is synonymous in this context for judges. It's not uncommon for that to happen. Certainly, that is uh, a possibility and one probably that I take. Uh, but there are other possibilities. Perhaps um, one option, and this is the second most popular option among interpreters, is that when he talks about little G-O-D-S, he's addressing uh, the Mesopotamian gods. Not real, but speaking to them as though they were real. Little G-O-D-S. He's saying, okay, all of these other little G-O-D-S, these make-believe gods, you've, you've uh, uh, you, you, you have set the stage for uh, injustice to happen. Uh, and so in verse 6 and 7, he says, you are little G-O-D-S, but uh, you are still subservient to the Most High God, and you will die like men. You've lost any sense of immortality. Now, we know that Baal was never capable of accomplishing anything. Is an impotent, uh, failed deity, and it wasn't for real. But the one true God uh, is for real. So uh, there's the first option. The one I lean to is the, uh, verse 1 speaks about assembling with the people of God, Israel, and judging. God is judging, making judgment on uh, G-O-D-S being the judges of Israel. And there are a couple of other options uh, that uh, we find, but these are the two most prominent. So I take the first one. I take the first one being uh, what he's talking about. The, another one is that he little G-O-D-S is a reference to angels, and that's not uncommon. We see that in Job, in, in the book of Job, where he talks about angels as, as little G-O-D-S. Doesn't, again, it doesn't mean that they are gods like deities, like, like we worship the one true God. It just means that they uh, that word, Elohim, is reference to angels. But uh, angelic uh, forms uh, rarely lose their, uh, they just, they don't become human and die, right? Uh, angels are not humans, and humans never become angels. Please understand that. So uh, that option is off the table as well. So if we take, as I do, if we take this passage and verse 1 and verses uh, 6 and 7 refer to the judges of Israel, uh, then we see that uh, he's, it's, it's insider language. It's all about Israel. If, however, we take the little G-O-D-S of verse 1 and verse 6 and 7, it's talking about the make-believe religions of humanity. But the message is still the same. God, who is the ruler of all things, God, who is the most high, God, who is the only true God, 
uh, God who sent Jesus on a mission to rescue sinners from uh, the guilt and stain of sin was raised from the dead on the third day and ascended to the right hand of the throne of God. God, the Trinity, God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, this Godhead, that is the only God. And so uh, <laughs> God expects and demands for his system of judgment to be carried out uh, in, among humanity, uh, that there is a system of judgment, ethics that flow from his word that he expects and demands to, to be carried out. Now, in American government, we know that we're a democracy or representational uh, Republican uh, uh, democracy, and, and so we know that, um, uh, that uh, the ethics of God's word is not always codified in the laws of our government uh, because we're a democracy. Um, but that's still the expectation that God has, that, that as we human beings living in America, followers of Jesus living in America, that, that God's expectation is that we follow the ethics that flow out of God's word and that we fulfill his will. So as God loves and values all human beings, that leads us to understand why it's so important for uh, the judgments to be made in accordance to his will. God's will is absolute truth. God's will is the pathway to perfect joy. God's will always flows through uh, the cross and the empty tomb into the arms of God's family through faith in Jesus Christ. And, and God's will is the, uh, the preeminent thing that must drive his people. Um, what we uh, see in this passage, so as we unwrap these things, a couple of things. First, God loves and values all human beings, expects for uh, uh, his, uh, the ethics of his word to be the law of the land, certainly. Um, and the reason is because God, First, God is the judge of all things. God is the judge of all people. Uh, this is verse 1 and 2. God takes his stand in his own congregation. This is a different translation. God takes his stand in his own congregation. He judges in the midst of the rulers. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? In the opening lines of this psalm, as I've taken it, there is a failure of the judges to... Um, rule in keeping with God's standard uh, found in his word. And he charges these rulers of Israel with injustice, especially as it relates to the, uh, to, to, to the wicked. He says, you're showing partiality to the wicked. Now, friends, as you and I, as followers of Jesus, we need to understand that when we show partiality to those uh, who are wicked, we are, uh, and judge in favor of the wicked. In this context, it's probably those who have wealth. It's probably those who are pursuing their own ambitions, not God's will. And in the context of the church, we know that James, uh, in, in James's letter, he says that it's a sin to show partiality, especially to the rich. That's, that is sinful, uh, and the same thing kind of applies here. God's saying, if your measure, if you're meeting out justice or meeting out your, um, uh, your, your judgments based upon how wealthy someone is or how poor someone is, that's sinful. Um, and so as we look at this passage, we need to understand that God demands um, not only that, 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 uh, uh, that the ethics flow from his word, and so the judgments flow from his word, but he expects you and me as followers of Christ to get in line with his word and relate to other people and use our influence for other people in a way that reflects the ethics of God's word. Uh, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, I want you to listen uh, to how God describes you and me as followers of Christ in this passage. 1 Peter 2, 9, he says, but you, those of us who are in Christ Jesus, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness 
into his marvelous light. We once lived as nameless men and women walking in a wasteland wilderness, but Jesus has given us his name. We are his chosen people. Uh, As followers of Christ, we're part of his family, and he demands that we who are followers of Christ, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, he demands that you and I live our lives and use our influence for judgments on behalf of others that flow out of the ethics of his word. When we make judgments based upon our own political inclinations rather than God's word, we've already messed up. Just because it's a part of the Democratic platform or just because it's part of the Republican platform or just because it's part of the Tea Party platform or the Libertarian platform or uh, Independent platform, however you want to slice it, if, if we ignore the word of God for our political platforms, we have fallen prey to unjust judgment because our judgments must flow from the ethics of God's word. As you look at political platforms and as you and I vote in America, and this is not true universally, not every nation is Uh, has a system of governance like we do, but in America especially, if we look at platforms and we choose the platforms that meets our own needs rather than the platform that reflects more fully the ethics of God's word, then we are guilty of unjust judgment. Uh, Again... um, There's a reason I vote the way I vote, and it's not because uh, I'm an evangelical and I vote along the block party line. I vote the way I vote because there is God's word that directs me on how to vote, and I try to vote as best I can in a way that reflects the ethics of God's word. It's hard. It's challenging. It's not uh, a binary choice in that way sometimes, but but we do the best we can given what we've got. Um, but even beyond voting, and really more important than voting, I want to use my influence for the cause of Christ. I want to use my influence in a way that reflects God's heart. Um, when When God tells us that we are His holy priesthood, offering up service that's acceptable to Him, It means that we must serve him in a way that fits who we are in Christ. That means that we relate to people in a particular way, in a way that flows from the ethics of God's word, which leads to a second point. God expects us to get involved. God expects you and me to get involved, specifically as it relates to those who have no power to help themselves. You're not going to escape this. Uh, No matter what you've heard in different media outlets, you're not going to escape this. As a follower of Jesus, verses 3 and 4 are a command to you and to me every single day. This isn't woke politics or woke religion. This is the living word of the living God to you and to me. Listen and obey the word of God. Verse 3, defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. The soul of the poor has shrunk into the corner of life because, uh, into the shadows of life because of internal distress and external struggle. The poor are those who are beaten up by life and have no power to defend themselves. Same thing's true for the fatherless. In the, uh, in, in the context of this passage, a fatherless person is someone who has no advocate for them and no heritage upon, uh, upon which they can lean. The poor have troubles that grow instead of shrink, and the boundaries of their heart somehow expand to hold all the raging anxieties and anguishes of life. And you and I are called by God to defend the poor and the fatherless, to 
do justice for those who are afflicted and needy. Those who are afflicted are those who are beset by circumstances that they cannot fix. You and I, again, this is not uh, one political party versus another political party. This is the word of God. And we need to embrace it as God's word and see how that we can fulfill what God is calling us to. He expects for us to get involved and, and to do justice for the afflicted and the needy, to deliver uh, the poor and the needy, those who are overwhelmed by life. This is our calling as followers of Christ, as the body of Christ, as the family that God has created through faith in Jesus Christ. Yes, we must be diligent to help the neediest among us. Um, through this passage, the Spirit of God calls us uh, to make the right and Christ-honoring decisions to bless those who are in need. And it's not just those um, who are in need who are part of our clan or our crew. It's to bless those who are uh, stamped by the image and the likeness of God. It's the calling. And so throughout this passage, God is calling us to take up the calls, uh, to uh, support the calls of the poor and the afflicted, uh, to do justice for them. Uh, again, uh, that is not the raging of a political platform, but rather it is the speaking of God's word. And our actions must flow through the, uh, from, uh, from uh, the ethics found in God's word. So uh, what, what happens if we fail to step up honoring Christ as his people and um, uh, be advocates and ambassadors of his grace and love and mercy to the poor and the needy and the fatherless and the afflicted. That, that, that's the third thing, instability. Instability grows when we fail to step up for God's glory. Uh, look at verse 5. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness, and all the foundations of the earth are unstable. All right, so the they there. Maybe the they are the poor and the afflicted, the fatherless and the needy. Maybe. The poor and the needy uh, don't know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness, and all the foundations of the earth are unstable. Or maybe... The they are the judges. The judges do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness, and all the foundations of the earth are unstable. Whether it's the poor and the afflicted or the judges, um, I, I think the best approach to verse 5 is for us to understand that the they is you and the they is me that you and I are called by God to stand in the gap for those who are poor and oppressed, afflicted and fatherless. You and I are called by the gospel itself to step up for the glory of God and help those who are in need. I'm thankful, I praise God, that we're part of a church that takes this seriously in the activities that we do on mission, the uh, helping the uh, afflicted and the poor in, in their need, uh, the food uh, insecure every single month. We do those certain things. But what about you individually and personally? Are you taking responsibility to stand in the gap for those who are poor and the afflicted? When I was uh, in high school, um, I was a sophomore in high school, and, and this was when I was in Dallas. And um, uh, it was a lunchtime uh, decision that I made. I was sitting there in lunch, and it was Lake Highlands High School in Dallas, Texas, Richardson, really. And, and so I'm, I'm there sitting in lunch and having a grand old time when a young man named Danny Hunter, a peer of mine, he and I played football together, played baseball together, and played basketball together. Danny Hunter started making fun of a young man named Scott. Now, Scott was a, man, a, a young man who had Down syndrome, and Danny Hunter made it his business to make fun of Scott. And I watched him begin that journey, and I sat there as long as I possibly could, but I would not be able to 
hold my head up if I let that continue. So I went over to Danny, and I stood between Danny and Scott, and I told Danny that he needed to stop making fun of Scott. And that led to a conflict between me and Danny. Now, the reality is Danny and I were peers. Scott and I were not so much peers. But Scott was in that position of afflicted or needy or uh, he, he was uh, in, in, a, in a position of weakness. Danny was in a position of strength. And Danny was using his strength to bully Scott. And so I stepped in. And it led to a conflict. Uh, a vice principal came up to me, uh, Vice Principal Holland came up to me after that encounter. And he uh, called me to his uh, office and he said, Eric, I just want you to know, I understand what happened. I understand about the conflict you got in with Danny. And I want you to know that I think it was a great thing for you to stand between Danny and Scott. And then he said this, he said, after all, isn't that what Jesus would have done? And the answer is yes. That, that's what Jesus did. Friends, you and I need to take personal responsibility um, for helping those who are helpless, standing in the gap for those who are needy. And when we fail to do that, when we fail to stand in the gap, then verse 5 tells us that we're, it's as if we're walking around without any understanding. It's as if we're walking around in the darkness. And the result is everything's unstable. It's chaotic. Friends, when the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the family of faith, when we fail to stand in the gap for those who are powerless or weak or in need, when we fail to do that very thing that a chosen generation, uh, his own special people, a royal priesthood, um, when we fail to live up to the name by which we're called, then the result is society is in chaos. So followers of Jesus, friends, please understand that I'm not asking us to be political advocates or anything like that. That's, that's not, I'm asking us to be faithful to this call from God. Remember verse 3 and 4. Defend uh, the poor and the fatherless. Do justice uh, for the afflicted. Deliver the poor and the needy. Today, you and I have a mandate. A mandate from God himself. And the question is, will we allow God the judge uh, to look upon us and say, you're doing good, well done. See, uh, the reality is, verse eight, uh, se uh, 6 uh, through 8, is uh, 6 and 7 is really a, a, an indictment against those, and I take it as followers of Jesus, who fail to stand up and fulfill what verses 3 and 4 demands. Fail to fulfill what God has called us to be and to do. It's, uh, you were called to be a judge, you're certainly a child of the Most High, but you're acting like a mere man, and you're going to die. He's saying, listen, you're not living up to the name that I've given you. Oh, friend, follower of Jesus, um, may our ethics flow from God's Word. Uh, because the last verse, verse 8, tells us exactly what's going to end up happening. God's going to rise up, and he is going to judge the earth. And he is going to call us account, to an account for how we fulfilled the calling that he's given us. Make no mistake, I am in no way saying that, that, uh, that we should uh, uh, abandon the gospel for the sake of defending the poor and the needy. Just the opposite. I'm saying we should proclaim the gospel as we defend and do justice for the poor and the needy. And that's our practice as a church, and I pray that it's your practice as part of this family of faith. Today, God is calling us to stand in the gap. He values and loves human beings, and we should as well. So let's do all that we can to be faithful to the one who has given us life, 
Let's do all that we can because God the judge is going to hold us to an account. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, infinitely above and beyond all that we ask or imagine, according to the power at work among us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to every generation forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. Good night.